Okay, good afternoon. Um, we might make a start. Um, I'd like to welcome you to uh, the second or the third mid seminar for 2021. Just to uh, acknowledge country to begin with, La Trobe University acknowledges that all our campuses located on the lands of many traditional custodians in Australia. We recognise their ongoing connection to the land and value their unique contribution to the, to the university and to wider Australian society. We're committed to providing opportunities for Indigenous Australians, both as individuals and communities through teaching and learning, research and community partnerships across all of our campuses. And the Trobe University pays our respects to Indigenous elders, past, present and emerging, and will continue to incorporate Indigenous knowledge systems and protocols as part of our ongoing strategic and operational business. And we also have a speaker this afternoon from uh, WA. Do you know whose lands you're on? Certainly do. We're on the lands of the Noongar Nation. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So we've got a, a different format this afternoon. We've got uh, four speakers, two very experienced uh, researchers uh, around issues to do with physical activity and people with intellectual disabilities, and two um, two budding new researchers who are in the midst of doing PhDs around issues for phys of physical activity. So we're going to split it into two halves as we normally do. The first two speakers will be Nora Shields and Jenny Downs, and then we'll have a quick break at four o'clock, and then Cara Schofield and Georgia McKenzie will, will present after that. So I'd like to introduce, first of all, Professor Nora Shields, who's a, a professor at La Trobe. She's a member of the Living with Disability Research Centre. Uh, she's a professor of, of, of physio, and has been working in the field of uh, physical activity for people and children and young people with intellectual disabilities for quite some time now and has sort of forged looking at lots of different subgroups of people with intellectual disability and has done some amazing work in this field and he's going to provide a sort of overview of some of the issues and then talk about a new study that she's doing at the moment and then she'll hand over to Jenny Downs and I'll introduce her um, when she begins, just before she begins to talk. So over to you, Nora. Oh, thank you, Chris, and welcome to everybody uh, to this afternoon's seminar. I too, in the spirit of reconciliation, acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I'm really pleased to be presenting today with um, my long-standing colleague, uh, Jenny Dans, and as Chris mentioned, two of our, our budding uh, research, early career researchers, Cara Schofield, who's in the first year of her PhD candidature, and George McKenzie, who's a little bit further along in her second year of, of candidature. Part of my brief uh, this afternoon is to um, really set the scene for you and to introduce you to some of the ideas and concepts that are going to come up in Jenny, Cara and George's uh, presentations. Um, and I'm going to outline four key ideas or key concepts and um, acknowledging that some of you are going to be very familiar with uh, these ideas and concepts and some of you will not be familiar with them or it might be the first time that you're hearing some of this information. So, um, you know, there's, there, 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 I, I recognise there's a sort of a mixture in, 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 the, in the audience. Um, now, let me just get my slides so I can, um, whoops, now, what's just happened there? Chris? You just use your, just click through them with your arrows on your keyboard. Yeah, uh, that might be, I'll tell you, Dave, it's just I'm trying to uh, come out of figure out where they are. No, hold on, I think if I just do that, there yep. we go. That's probably the best thing, sorry about that. That's okay. So the first key idea is uh, this idea about what is physical activity and what is exercise, because the, the terms physical activity and exercise are often used interchangeably by people to mean the same thing, but in fact, they're quite different things. And so it's just important to recognize what we mean when we say physical activity and what we mean when we say exercise. So physical activity is any bodily movement produced by skeletal muscles that result in energy expenditure. And this essentially boils down to everyday movement. So, um, you know, uh, 
standing up from sitting on the chair or going walking or scratching your head. They're, they're all examples of physical activities. Exercise is a subset of physical activity. Um, and the difference or the key differences with regard to exercise is, is that exercise is planned physical activity. It's usually quite structured, it's often repetitive, but the main objective is always to improve or to maintain physical fitness. And so often, you know, we talk about maybe formal physical activity and informal or organized physical activity and informal. And really when we're talking about formal or organized physical activity, we're talking about exercise and kind of everything else is physical activity. I'm gonna have this problem every time. Sorry, I'm just working off, uh, here we go. Now, a major sort of, um, step through um, or step in, in our physical activity uh, guidelines was actually the release in just November last year, so a number of months ago, of the latest iteration of the World Health Organization gui physical activity guidelines. Um, and um, I've, the diagram that I've included up here for you is really a bit of an evolution of those physical activity guidelines. So you can kind of see, um, you know, these initial guidelines probably date back to the early 80s and um, there were some uh, iterations going through the 80s and you know that the last major revision of these guidelines happened in, in 2010 which is 10 years ago but there's some differences in the new guidelines which are really important to this um, in this audience particularly and um, the first of those is is that this is the first time and you'll notice this up here this is actually the first time in the guidelines that people with, it, with disability actually get their own sort of separate chapter or separate section of the guidelines. So prior to this, the, the guidelines were very general and they, they really just kind of specified that they applied to people with disability or that people with disability should be as active as their condition allows. So it was quite very vague and general. Um, advice on physical activity, whereas in this iteration, um, there are some specific groups that um, we now have some clearer guidelines on and disability is one of those groups. And I think that's a really Im important thing for the sector. The second um, big thing about these new guidelines, and this will link very much into Jenny's um, presentation just after mine, is the fact that these guidelines are guidelines for physical activity and sedentary behaviour. Um, and just to sort of clarify, because often people sort of think of these things as two sides of the same coin or, you know, one's the corollary of the other. So you're either active or you're sedentary. Um, but in fact, in, in the guidelines, these, both of these things have independent paths to being important. So it's not enough just to kind of tick the box and, and, and the act. You, you, the limitation or limiting sedentary activity is equally as important to our health as being physically active. So for example, there's no point in me sitting for eight hours without any breaks or without moving from my chair and then going for a run for an hour because my body actually needs to move during those, those eight hours as well. And that breaking up of sedentary activity that I might do every half an hour um, actually has really important benefits for my metabolic syndrome system. Um, equally, my going for a run at the end of my workday has really important benefits for my heart and my lungs, but also for my mental health and well-being um, in order to, 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 to calm down after the workday. So um, both of these ideas, physical activity and sedentary behavior, are, are, are really, really important. Um, with the physical activity guidelines, um, I also wanted to just have a bit of a shout out for the fact that these are really important for everybody. And one of the nice things about the, the guidelines is they really are focusing on, on key messages that, that are important uh, you know, across anyone, regardless of whether you have a disability or not. So um, I'm putting this up here just to actually give a shout out to every member of the audience that if you don't know very much about physical activity guidelines, this is, this is one sort of key 
um, message or key um, thing that you could do for yourself in your life is to, to actually read these guidelines and um, to, to think about how you can incorporate these guidelines into your, into your everyday being. Um, the, the first one is, is really important here because the, the other thing about the guidelines is, is that often there might have been a focus very much on physical health. Um, but in fact, um, you know, the, the, the more research we do and the more that we know about the benefits of physical activity, the more we're realizing that it has incredibly important mental health benefits, social health benefits and cognitive benefits. And these are the emerging areas um, that will continue to develop and grow over the next number of years. And they're also, um, you'll hear a bit more from Georgia about how some of these benefits other than physical health benefits are really important and recognized by young adults with disability. Um, one little piece of work uh, that I wanted to talk for a minute about um, was this work that I did with a colleague of mine, Leanne Hassett from the University of Sydney. Um, together we analyzed data from uh, Sport Australia. So Sport Australia run a survey, an annual survey of about 20,000 Australians each year to monitor um, participation in physical activity and sport. Um, and part of the, the survey asks um, adults who take part in the survey to indicate if they have a disability or not. Now, their definition of disability is very broad um, and can encompass a disability or a physical health condition um, that can limit your participation. Um, but I think what you'll see from a, you know, straight across the board is that across pretty much all age ranges, the red bars are lower than the blue bars. And what that's telling us is that adults with disability are participating less in physical activity and sport or active recreation pretty much across the lifespan. Now the eagle eyes in the audience might sort of notice this one where the bars are reversed. And you might think, oh, well, you know, the 18 and 19 year olds are doing pretty well. But I reckon this is a little bit of a lack of precision in the data because this bar, um, while all the red bars generally include, you know, 500 to 2000 people, this one includes only 70 people here. So I think there's just a lack of precision in this. I don't think that there's actually a reversal of, of play in that, in that um, particular age group. Now, the second key idea that I wanted to introduce is the concept of participation. And um, some of you will be very familiar with this diagram. This is a diagrammatic representation of the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health, published by the World Health Organization in 2001. Um, and this was really a bit of a game changer in the health field in terms of how we um, think about and talk about um, disability in relation to health. Um, one of the reasons um, that I bring it up here is, is that it was one of the first times that the, the idea or the concept of participation was really floated and um, on, on a sort of a large scale. And it's defined in the ICF as involvement in a life situation, um, which is quite broad and all encompassing and um, requires a little bit more teasing out if you want to be able to measure it or if you want to be able to intervene and figure out if you're making a difference or not. So more recently, um, my colleague Christine Imms at the University of Melbourne has tried to take this concept of, of participation and to better define it for us in a way that we can then think about how it might be measured. And she's described what's called the family of participation related constructs because there are a number of constructs that come into play when we talk about participation, not least of which is of course, the environment that you're in or the context or the setting that you're participating in. Two of the key things um, that have emerged from this are the key ideas within the family of participation related constructs, however, are the ideas of attendance and involvement. So attendance is showing up, being there, and then involvement is what happens when you are there. So of course, in order to be involved, you need to attend. Um, and the reason I wanted to 
introduce you to this is, is uh, again, Georgia is going to talk a little bit about how she's used the family of participation related constructs in order to be able to interpret some of the data that she's going to talk to you about a little bit later on this afternoon. The third idea that I wanted to um, sort of introduce to you here is this idea about secondary health conditions. Now, for most of us, our health is kind of determined either by our genetics or about our lifestyle choices. But of course, for people with disability, there's a third dimension to it. And that's really the onset and the course of secondary health conditions and their additive effect on changes in health and function. So as the diagram shows, there are lots of, um, and again here, the, the red bars indicate um, adults with disabilities and the blue are adults without disabilities. And what's immediately apparent is that adults with disabilities are at higher risk of lots of psychosocial secondary conditions. And these are things like um, anxiety and depression, um, or more broadly, social isolation or smaller social networks, um, but also encompassing and including um, difficulties with communication or difficulties with, with sleep. But they're also, and, and, and this is just the psychosocial conditions that, that they may be more likely to, to experience. There's a whole range of physical secondary conditions that are more prevalent among um, people with disability, not least of which are pain, deconditioning and fatigue. And these can really have a, um, a huge impact on somebody's participation in physical activity and exercise. The thing is, is that secondary conditions like the things that I've just mentioned, they're not inevitable they can be prevented and they can be managed. And exercise is a really key part of their prevention or of their management. So we've got some statistics around, um, you know, how many Australians with, with disability are sufficiently active. And it's, you know, it's probably in or around the 20% range. But the thing is, is that for those adults with disability who are also sedentary and who don't participate in any physical activity, that group is 50% more likely to report one or more chronic health conditions. And so this goes some way to indicating that for, for this group of people, for adults with disability, um, being involved or participating in physical activities in physical recreation and in exercise is incredibly important. Now the third or the fourth key idea, now up to four, the fourth key idea that I wanted to, to introduce you to is just this idea about where the evidence base currently is in terms of exercise for people with disability. So a couple of slides ago, I sort of indicated that, you know, last year was the first time that the WHO had included people with disability as part of, you know, as a separate group in, in their guidelines. And part of this might be, be explained by what we see on this slide here. So this is a piece of work that I did about two years ago. So if, if I ran the same thing today, I'd probably get slightly different numbers, but I think the, the, the sense of what's happening really hasn't changed in that period of time. So what I did was is that I took two, um, two of the key uh, um, disability groups that I work with, so uh, people with cerebral palsy and people with Down syndrome, and I looked at the numbers of um, trials, so either randomized or controlled clinical trials that um, involved an exercise or physical activity intervention. Um, and I, you know, what, what you can see here is, is that, you know, this, in cerebral palsy, there's, there's quite a large number of, um, of clinical trials that have been done in, in exercise. So, you know, 110, that's, that's quite, a, quite a robust evidence base. Um, in, in intellectual disability, in this case in, in Down syndrome, the evidence base is a lot smaller. But across both of them, the thing that you will see is that the vast majority of that evidence has come in the last 10 years. And so that partly explains why, you know, the WHO is now in a position to actually make some more specific recommendations in disability because 
this evidence base really didn't exist 10 years ago, whereas it, it now does. So that's, that's really important. There is now an evidence base and it's really recent. However, there's a couple of other things you might see. The first thing is, is that if we delve a little bit down into who the participants in these studies are, by and large, they're children. They're younger children, primary school aged. The minute you move into adolescents or in adults, the number of trials that are relevant or the amount of the evidence base that's relevant to you suddenly shrinks hugely. And again, this sort of reflects what we see in, in, in practice. So we've got very good at managing childhood disability um, early in life, but actually once you grow up and become a young adult or, um, and, and move into the adult um, health service, or you transition into adult services, there actually isn't an evidence base really there for you in, in, in certainly in terms of exercise and physical activity or what's there is, is really quite small. So, um, so that's the second thing is, is that um, most of the, the evidence base is, is, is reported in, in children. And the third thing is, is that if we begin to look at the, the type or the severity of the disability that um, the, the people who participated in these trials had, the more severe your level of disability, so either um, physical disability in, in the case of cerebral palsy or in you know, intellectual disability in the, same, in the case of Down syndrome, the more likely you are to be outright excluded from the trial, so just not to be allowed in in the first place, or that th there's a very small amount of studies or a very small number of participants in these studies with more um, severe disability. So if you happen to be an adult with an intellectual disability and a severe intellectual disability, there's actually very little evidence base around how we should be um, you know, implementing exercise or facilitating your participation in, in physical exercise. So um, this has got to change kind of thing. And I actually think that the next 10 years, this is the next frontier of exercise research for us. The other thing that's kind of becoming more apparent is, is that um, you know, we're beginning to see hints um, from young people with disability about how important physical activity is to them, particularly for those who have more, what I'm going to call complex disability. So um, this, this, the, their disability is more severe or there are a number of other things going on that make the situation more complex. Um, and the British Journal of Sports Medicine published an editorial in September 2020, which re reports the um, uh, opinions of a small group of um, young adults with um, cerebral palsy um, who have gross motor abilities uh, classified as GMFCS4. Uh, um, and what that means is, is that they will um, use a wheelchair pretty much most of the time to, to, to get around. Um, and they participated in the Paraswim program, which is a, um, a physical activity program and, you know, developed by uh, Sean Tweedy from uh, UQ. And um, essentially it's a program of, um, it's, it's, it's an athlete development program for young people with um, severe uh, disability. But what you'll notice from the quotes that, that come um, from these young people in the editorial is, is that they're really talking beyond the physical benefits of, of participating in uh, physical activity. So um, Haley here talks about, I now think of myself as an, ad, uh, as an athlete, not just somebody with a, with a disability. Um, you know, or see down here, you know, it's the first time I've been physically challenged and inspired to, to reach physical fitness. So talking to um, you know, the kind of, I suppose the, the previous low expectations that were, were, were placed on him around physical activity. Another example of um, you know, the sort of burgeoning research that's coming out of this area was a, a paper that was published um, a couple of years ago in Research and Practice in Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. So uh, Chris Bigby is the editor of, of the journal. Um, and this was a, a, a very small study that talked about 
um, three young people with severe intellectual disability and the process that um, this particular program went through in order to facilitate their engagement in three very simple exercises. And, and um, I was invited to provide a commentary on, on this. And, you know, while this is a little bit of a step away from really robust, um, you know, high level randomized controlled trial evidence, there are some really important learnings in here for all of us, just in terms of um, the level of time, the level of skill, um, and the level of effort that needs to that, that we need to to go to in order to um, you know facilitate the participation of those with more complex disability in, in physical activity and exercise. And it's probably a reason why the evidence base has been to this date so small. Is is that it's 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 tricky and it's difficult, and so people have um, have tried to do easier things to to start off with. And, and, and that's a little bit like what, what I did with my research in that when, when I started um, uh, working in physical activity for people with intellectual disabilities, you know, we, I did a series of studies and um, these are all three randomized controlled trials that all involved young adults with Down syndrome. Um, and before I did any of this work, there were no randomized control trials in this area. And, um, you know, sort of, so within a five year span, we, we had, we had um, run three trials. And it was on the basis of these trials that I then got invited to speak to a group, um, the Prader-Willi syndrome community. Now, again, I know some of you will be very familiar with Prader-Willi syndrome. Um, but some of you may not, and that was certainly the case with me when I first got um, invited to speak to them. Um, and you're going to hear a little bit more about the work that um, you know we are currently um, doing with the Prader-Willi syndrome community, and Cara is going to talk to that um, in in her presentation. Um, but it is a rare genetic condition, and some of the key things about the condition that you may or may not know is is a hyperphagia which is an unrelenting drive to eat and, and, and not feeling sated or satisfied. Um, and what that means is, is that um, people with Prader-Willi syndrome have very strictly controlled diets and access to food is, is likewise strictly controlled. So in the homes of, of um, people with Prader-Willi syndrome, food is kept under lock and key and, and, and access is, is, is restricted. Um, most people with Prader-Willi syndrome have an intellectual disability and many will have um, behavioural issues that are as a result of the genetic effects on the part of the brain that's affected, the, the hypothalamus, which is really the emotion centre of the brain. From my perspective, it's the musculoskeletal consequences of having Prader-Willi syndrome that, that has been of interest to me. Um, and that's both the, the effect on bones and bone growth. So um, historically, people with Prader-Willi syndrome were shorter in stature. And more recently, that has changed in, um, with the development of um, an administration of growth hormones. So most children with Prader-Willi syndrome who are born now will receive growth hormone which will um, increase the, the length of their bones as they, as they grow or will facilitate that. Um, of course, the other part of the musculoskeletal system is the, is the muscle system. And so muscles of people with Prader-Willi are also quite different in their composition or in their makeup to, to the rest of us. Um, and so one of my interests was, well, how can exercise or can exercise have a, have a positive impact on the muscle composition of of, of this group, um, and of course when we started there were there were no randomised controlled trials um, in this area, so we started by doing one. So we did a, a small um, trial that we we published just a couple of years ago, um, and um, that trial led to this, which is the PRESTO trial, which is funded by the Medical Research Future Fund, and which is the trial that we're currently doing. So we're recruiting 60 people with Prader-Willi between the ages of 13 and 60 from all across Australia. So we have three um, key assessment sites based in Melbourne, Sydney, and Brisbane. Um, because Prader-Willi is a rare condition, um, we need to do a national trial in order to be able to get the sample size that we need for the study. 
um, and that just adds to the, the, the complexity of, of the work that we're doing. Everybody who um, uh, enters the study or um, agrees to be involved, um, they're in the study for, for a year. And um, over that period of a year, we um, complete some assessments with them at various time points. So at the very start of the study, um, midway through the study, and then at the end of the study. After the very first assessment, what we do is we randomly allocate those participants to one of, of two groups. But regardless of which group they're um, um, allocated into, either the experimental or the control group, they will complete a supervised exercise program at their local community gym with an exercise professional for 24 weeks. They'll, they'll do an exercise program twice a week for 24 weeks. Um, and the, the bit that I want to draw your attention to is just this, this bit in the middle because Cara is going to talk much um, further about the focused ethnography study, which is one of three um, embedded studies that we have within the, in the trial. So um, one of the things about the, the trial is it's really a vehicle to um, learning some other things in addition to the, the, the benefits of of, of exercise. So um, this particular trial has a health economic analysis embedded in, in it, a focused ethnography study, which Cara will tell you about, and also a qualitative study that will look at the experience of participation in, in the community gym. Another key feature that's really important in, in all our trials is consumer involvement. And so the, the, the governance structure of the trial is that, that the trial steering committee oversees the trial and that in, in, includes two consumer representatives from the Proud of Willie community and their role is really critical in, um, in some of the decision making about when we do stuff and how we do stuff and um, they've, they've played a really important role um, in the trials so far. Um, and the other sort of aspect of community, uh, consumer involvement is, is that we do work with a number of groups that um, advocate for people with uh, prader willi syndrome. So um, we've received some funding from the prader willi Research Foundation of Australia and from the Foundation of prader willi Research in the US, which have provided a top-up scholarship uh, to Cara to, to, to be able to pursue her PhD. Um, I've already mentioned that it's a, a national study and that um, part of that is, is that we like to facilitate travel to those major centres where we can for people who, who live outside of the major centres. Um, but equally, we like to facilitate as best we can to be able to um, you know, complete the assessments in a, in a, at a time in a venue that's suitable for, for, the, for the family if that's what facil facilitates participation. So with trials like these, um, we um, have had to really uh, think carefully about how we can really make it as easy as possible for people to participate and, and to, to, to be involved. Um, of course, this work doesn't happen in isolation. So just before I hand over to Jenny, I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge the huge team of people that um, this work represents. Um, the Presser Trial Chief Investigators are a group of um, researchers from across four universities, including La Trobe. We also have a, a group of associate investigators, um, and many of these are either consumer representatives or um, clinicians who are involved in um, um, the sort of clinical settings or in, in, in hospital sites, um, in addition to our trial coordinator, Alicia Southby. Um, and I'd finally just like to, to um, acknowledge the funding sources for, for the work to date. So with that, Chris, I might hand back to you so that you can um, uh, introduce Jenny. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Nora. That's a really interesting introduction, um, which will set the scene for the other presentations. Um, we're going to, to go straight on to Jenny, but if you do, if you're in the audience and you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, and then we'll get to them when Jenny's finished speaking. But if you put them in early, then uh, we'll be able to see what's coming along. So I'd like to introduce uh, Associate Professor Jenny Downs, who is the Program Lead of Child and Disability Health and Wellbeing at the Telethon Kids Institute, which is over the other side of the world in Perth, um, where it's always warm 
<laughs> the sun always shines. Um, so she's going, she's been a collaborator of Nora for, for many years and is a co-supervisor of, of Cara. Um, and she's going to talk about a trial that she's been running with people with Rett syndrome, which is another fairly rare uh, syndrome. So over to you, Jenny, and welcome to the LID seminar. And you're on mute. <laughs> okay, can you hear me and can you hear my slides? Yep. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you, Christine, for introducing. Um, and thank you very much, Nora, for being able to follow in your footsteps. We have very related interests with disability and with activity. And again, I would like to acknowledge that I am on the land of the Noongar Nation here in Western Australia. It's a very large land area in the southwest of Western Australia and, and also acknowledge elders uh, past, present and emerging so my topic today is how we can support girls and women with Rett syndrome. And on the basis of Nora's um, conceptual um, sort of introduction to physical activity and sedentary behaviours, we really are with this group of individuals looking at light physical activities. So just to introduce myself, um, my goal, my vision is that children with disability can achieve a, a, a strong, their best quality of life. And we look at, um, we have a whole, whole lot of uh, suites of studies where we look at genetic determinants, environmental determinants, and we look comprehensively at outcomes across health, well-being, and quality of life for both the child and the family. I have um, I work with a lot of different conditions, and you'll notice the second box from the left. Your left is the there's a focus on rare genetic conditions, and one of those is Rett syndrome. That's what I'll be talking about today. And within um, each of these disorders, I have work in relation to outcome measures, understanding modifiable determinants, factors that we may be able to change to achieve better outcomes, and also intervention effectiveness. And in relation to physical activity, I will be able to present some information on outcome measures, how we measure that in Rett syndrome, and intervention effectiveness, moving on to the work leading up to our clinical trial. So firstly, what is Rett syndrome? Rett syndrome is a rare neurological condition. It is caused um, by a, a variant, a mutation that is pathogenic on the MECP2 gene, which is critical for neurological functioning. And it occurs rarely. It occurs in about one in 18,000 children born, but it mainly affects females. So in girls, it occurs in about one in 9,000 girls. And the little girl is doing well in her first six to 18 months, but then experiences a period of developmental regression. And here is a time period with great distress for families, but she loses hand skills, communication skills, and also develops some peculiarities, hand stereotypies, and also un an unusual gait. And there are other criteria for the condition, altered breathing patterns, bruxism or teeth grinding. You can see a list of other associated criteria. But at the bottom, you can see intense eye communication. And it is this capacity for extraordinarily strong um, skills with communication that really makes a difference to working with, with girls with Rett syndrome. It's a great asset for them. And the title for this slide is Clinical Peculiarities and Biological Mysteries. And this was a, t um, a phrase coined by a very famous Swedish neurologist, Bengt Hagberg, who some of you may have come across because he is well known for his work with cerebral palsy as well as Rett syndrome. And he was fascinated by this condition and he really mapped how all of these features came together to become Rett syndrome. He was part of the original fathers who were involved in uh, describing the condition and also mapping its characteristics. So I pay tribute to his work with that phrase at the top of that slide. So there are difficulties with functional abilities and there are difficulties with comorbidities, but I think it's really important to take um, careful stock 
of all of the strengths. The girls have remarkable capacity for learning. They enjoy activities, remarkable um, abilities to establish and maintain social uh, relationship and extraordinarily um, able to communicate that enjoyment with, with winning smiles. And really it brings us to this idea of quality of life, which is this balance of things that are hard for us and things that are very, um, are, are going well and with which we feel, feel satisfied and well. And, and this is quality of life. It's how we are satisfied with all of our life experiences. And, and just quickly, this is part of the um, thought processes of organisations in our society at the level of the United Nations up the top, right down to the feelings and thoughts and actions within individual families, where the child comes first and it's their well-being that comes first rather than their disability. And really this quality of life framework is a part of what drives us in our group to understanding participation, understanding activities, understanding what these comorbidities actually do mean to find ways that they can, we can um, contribute to um, and support quality of life being going well for, for those, in, uh, the, the, the children and adults with Rett syndrome. So I'll first come to um, uh, the notion of physical activity and sedentary behaviour. Nora set the scene with those um, concepts. And, and here we have the idea of skills and activity. The skills are what an individual can do. You might be able to sit or get up from sitting, walk, you might be able to grasp objects, feed yourself. But then your physical activity is what you do do and it adds up as Nora describes over the day. It's the time you spend active, the time you spend standing, the time you're, you're walking or how many steps you actually take. And so skills are important, but physical activity is a separate idea and actually much more of how those skills are represented in daily activities. So with Rett syndrome, um, we have, in fact, I'll lead you to the bottom part of the left column where you'll, you'll see there is some evidence that physical activity programs can increase skill levels and fitness. But we really have very little information other than that. We know that there are benefits for the general population and Nora highlighted how in the recent guidelines, the benefits are beyond fitness and endurance, but really to mental health, social well-being, and, and, and those and cognitive functioning. And really, we don't know how those extra benefits might, might play out for people with, with Rett syndrome. So the first question we have to ask is what is the physical activity? What is the sedentary, um, sedentary time and how do we measure it? And this slide is showing you how we set out to start that process. We tested three devices, the stepwatch, which goes around the ankle, the active power, which attaches to the front of the thigh, and the actigraph, which you wear on a, a, a band around your waist. And you can see those two sets of graphs under each of them. And what you can see is the red line going across each graph, which means zero difference compared to the number of steps shown in a video. And, um, and at the bottom, you can see the video steps per minute correlated with the, the accelerometer steps. And in the bottom graphs, they all correlate well. But when you look at the differences, you can see that the step watch me measured well. Roughly, the average difference was close to zero. The active power did not measure steps well. It undercounted the steps and the actigraph undercounted steps even further. So this is important foundational works that work that is important because we need to develop good interventions, but equally to know if our interventions really are helping, we need um, well validated measures that we know will be fit for purpose with that population. So I'm pointing this out because this has been uh, the physical activity journey with Rett syndrome started back in 2011 and has been this long process of us pulling information together. We also wanted to know how do we measure posture? How do we measure sedentary time? 
And you can see here, this was the active power, the one that goes on the front of the leg, which on the, the left-hand graph, you can see the um, average duration of sitting in by the active power was almost the same as what we saw on the video. And again, we don't get the, right, the same um, accuracy for standing. We over-represent standing and we under-represent walking. So this is exactly the same for standing and walking. We can see why we under and under identify walking because the algorithm is not um, is not recognizing all of the steps in this population. But we did establish that we can use the active power for measuring sedentary behavior. So hence we have two measures, one for activity and one for sedentary behaviors. Um, we've looked at the the this, the, the patterns of activity over the course of the day. And on the left, you can see that the majority of time is spent with zero steps in a minute. This is using the, set, the, uh, the measure around the ankle. And that smaller amounts of time are, are spent in activities, including steps. But you can also see that the majority of that active time is spent with very slow walking. Slow, gentle pace of walking is the typical activity in Rett syndrome. And that's really giving us a really important clue that to work with physical activity in a, in a, in a condition where impairments have a marked impact on functioning, we really need to focus not on vigorous or moderate intensity of activity, we need to focus on lots more of gentle light intensity um, in, uh, uh, activities. And here you can see how that maps in terms of sedentary time and by the capacity to walk. So the average across this group with, with different walking levels is the blue line. And you can see that for children who need assistance to walk, they will have more sedentary time and children in the purple who, who uh, walk independently have less sedentary time. So we have different needs, but we want to be able to address children who can walk as, as well as those who need, need assistance to walk. So that brings us to the concept of uptime, where we would, um, this was actually um, first published by some uh, physiotherapists, I believe at Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. And they talked about children being up in standing and walking for activities was um, versus sitting and lying through, uh, for activities throughout their day and divided that into uptime and downtime. And that with or without assistance is, is where we are interested in that for Rett syndrome. So, so we now know we can measure activity, we can measure sedentary behaviours, and we would expect that if we could increase the volume of light physical activities, that could be um, a useful target, and it could also be associated with some benefits uh, for physical well-being, potentially for mental well-being, and, 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 and potentially also for social, social immersion and engagement. So our next question is, how do we support uptime in Rett syndrome? And you can see these um, interesting looking logos on the side of this screen. And these are my, my colleagues in Israel at Ariel University and the University of Haifa, and also my colleague in Denmark in Copenhagen. And the four of us are working together on a study that is funded by RettSyndrome.org, that is the peak advocacy body based in the US for Rett syndrome. And our goal is to understand how we can support more activity uptime in Rett syndrome and, how, and whether we can um, show that that has demonstrable benefits using a clinical trial methodology. So it's terrific to do an international trial. In the first instance, we consulted with families and therapists, and these were families and therapists who came from, I think our total was 46 countries across the world. We administered an, uh, an anonymous survey, actually. We promoted it through our networks, through the family advocacy organisations, and, 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 and also managed to make a few translations as well. And, um, which was terrific. We, we had 107 parent caregivers respond, 43 therapists and other health professionals. And we asked them about barriers and enablers. And we asked them, how do you manage to increase standing and walking activities for the individual with Rett syndrome uh, with, for whom you provide care? 
So again, um, Nora presented the ICF framework, which you, um, you uh, were able to see, and how there are different aspects of how we live. We have our body structure and function. We have the activities that we're participating in the day, and we, sorry, that we do throughout our day. And we also have participation in activities that are meaningful. Each of those interrelate. And then the environment and personal factors also have, have substantial influences on each of those, um, those factors. And I've also drawn attention to the, um, the, in brackets underneath each of them, the F words. And we use the coding of the, um, the information we got in our survey into F words because they are um, pro uh, uh, proposed by Peter Rosenbaum in Canada as different ways of conceptualizing these domains in a way that's really um, makes sense conceptually for um, the children, families, and, and, and across um, all aspects of those caring as well. And each of those, as I mentioned before, add up to contribute, have contributions to make to quality of life. So with the strategies that we were able to develop, we um, coded them using this F word framework. And we found that there were strategies that could, could support the person. And these related to fitness and function. So that's body structure and function and activities. And really that was about evaluating and building capacity for that individual to participate in uptime. And the second aspect related to the person was about fun the personal factors and finding strategies that really help to build mental health and motivation. And I know there's a lot of text on this slide, but it really is, um, there's some terrific strategies there that have really built into, a, we've, we've managed to build into our intervention for the trial that we have, are now running. And then from the point of view of creating a supportive environment, the family and friendships came up very strongly as building a rich social environment. And here it's not just physical activity and getting up out of your chair and standing, it's doing that meaningfully with um, focus on the, the participation rather than the performance collaboratively with families, friends and other staff and using environments to the, to the optimal advantage, particularly taking advantage of natural environments. And, and, and the final column is um, the physical environment. And there wasn't actually an F word for the physical environment, but we're translating that to the Danish word for physical, which does start with F. So we were very pleased about that. And each of these, you can see strategies that we have taken from consulting with the community and have built into the intervention we're now testing in our trial. And each of those ICF domains we observe to be interconnected when providing a strategy, developing a strategy, and that really guided us in how we could um, support families in finding an optimal um, uh, routine for uptime in daily life. So I would now like to introduce you to our clinical trial. And again, the same, the same logos. We, we have a, 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 we're the same team. And um, we, our goal is to increase uptime within a participation framework. And we have a multi-site randomized controlled trial. We have Australia, Denmark, and Israel. And we are delivering an intervention uh, a telehealth style where we're on the phone, we're on Zoom or we're on Skype with the parent caregivers and we connect also with therapists or day, day activity centres or group homes as, as is, is needed. And um, sorry, I'm just looking for my mouse. <laughs> um, and we have children from five years and older and all of the individuals for this trial are recruited to this point in time. Our sample size calculation required that we needed 42. We opted to elect uh, 50, uh, to recruit more than 50, just in case there was some dropout. Uh, and we wanted to make sure we could achieve our, our sample size. And I think I might have said a second ago, we have recruited everybody at the, the drop of a hat and a heartbeat. We had families who wanted to join this trial. And so it's, it's terrific. It's a terrific journey so far. And I just attach a couple of pictures so far of a standing activity and, and a girl who, 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 who has regular walking activity additional to outside her, 
her treadmill, but here she is on her treadmill. So our model for providing the inter intervention is shown on this slide. And, and I think this model is quite, um, uh, I hope it's of interest. We've had community input into how we're designing the intervention, which I presented on the previous slide. We have our delivery assessment ass uh, system and processes. We have our assessments. We know what wearable devices to, to use to get um, reliable and valid data. We have a set of um, parent reported outcomes as well on beh health, behaviour and quality of life. We then implement our, our program of support. And that involves us, the therapist, ringing um, the, the caregivers. And there's feedback, there's interactions, there's goals that are set. And then the outcome for that sort of process, hope, we hope, will be positive outcomes. That, that's yet to be determined. And so here is our intervention structure. We have a baseline evaluation. We, we, we evaluate gross motor skills, participation, likes and dislikes, the social networks that we, where we can find opportunities. And then we work with the caregivers to co-design goals and activities within a participation framework. It's not an exercise to stand up more or walk more steps but it's built around the, the notion of meaningful participation that includes as much socialization as we can. So there's physical engagement, social engagement, and activities that are motivating and enjoyable. So hopefully self-engagement as well. We implement that in usual settings and we, we contact families regularly at two, at two week um, intervals over a 12 week period. And then we can collect feedback, we can, uh, set more goals, keep the same goals, we can adjust the goals and we really plan those specifically, what the goals might be, where they might be conducted, when would they be conducted, with whom and why and that comes back to the meaning and this is a, a cyclical process before we um, collect our post-intervention information. So we haven't got our results yet, and um, we're probably about another three or four months from a complete data set, away from a complete data set. So by the end of the year, I will be very, very excited to see what the, um, the, the, the evidence is for using a participation framework to support um, more physical activity and reduce the levels of sedentary behaviours. We have so little evidence as to what we can do intuitively. We might have a sense of how to increase physical activity, but we really need evidence because we want to be able to support the outcome properly. And if we do that, we may well need funding from uh, bodies such as um, the NDIS. So the evidence base is absolutely critical. And to this point, this is the first uh, clinical trial that is evaluating a, a physical activity intervention for Rett syndrome. Um, Again, I would highlight that with the trial intervention, we started with community um, co-design. We collected information and we also spoke with families about how that might all knit together. We're using a remote style of support, which is um, very useful. We can work with families in any state across Australia and in Denmark there. They ha we have all needed the capacity for remote strategies over the COVID-19 um, pandemic with the associated lockdowns. And, and the final point I would like to make is how any activities really, um, as part of one of the guiding principles was that they ought to be considered within a participation framework that is meaningful to the participant. And that is our um, very much a part of the goal. So acknowledgements to all of the families uh, we've recruited across our three countries. There are um, a, you know, a terrific bunch, nearly you know, 55, 60, 60 families. And our, our financial support and funding has come from RetSyndrome.org for this particular project. Okay, we might start again if everybody's ready. Um, I'm gonna introduce Cara Schofield, who's on mute at the moment. She's about to unmute. Cara is a PhD student. She's just finished her first year, I think. Her background's in public health. Yep. Um, she was probably luckily stuck in Perth for the last 12 months and has recently 
finally made the trip to Melbourne and is now um, responsed at La Trobe. So, um, and Cara is focusing on one part of the trial uh, that Nora talked about. So over to you, Cara. Thanks for the introduction, Christine. Um, before I start, just a bit about my background. I started working with people who have prader willi syndrome at the Telethon Kids Institute in WA with Prof Associate Professor Jenny Downs and Professor Catherine Chung. I was coordinating a project to start a national database for people with prader willi syndrome. I then decided that I would complete an honours degree at the University of Western Australia, looking at how behavioural issues in people with prader willi syndrome can be supported with trauma-informed practice. I met Nora at a conference, a prader willi syndrome conference, and I decided to apply for a PhD with her in part with the PRESTO trial. Many people say that there are often bumpy roads when starting a P or doing a PhD. And as Christine mentioned, my first road bump hit when COVID did. Um, and I've been stuck in Perth for the last 12 months, or rather not stuck, but blissfully in Perth. And I finally made the journey over to Melbourne. And today I'll be presenting an outline of my thesis with an explanation of a focused ethnography as part of the PRESTO trial, which again, Nora has already mentioned. My thesis is titled Behavioural Influences to Physical Activity for Pro People with prader willi Syndrome Across the Lifespan. And I'll be running through an overview of the studies to be completed in my thesis, again, with an emphasis on the ethnography. So to start some important background in regarding the thesis as a whole. Developmental disabilities such as prader willi syndrome are conditions associated with physical learning, language, social and behavioural impairments, which often lead to barriers in participating in exercise. Participation in exercise may be made more difficult by impairments, additional impairments such as intellectual disability, low muscle tone or communication difficulties as Nora has previously mentioned. These barriers can be compounded again by the environmental and social context. The social context refers to the interaction between a person and their environment. The physical environment can also be a barrier to exercising for people with a disability due to inaccessible, inaccessible facilities and the noise levels, which may, which may be high in a community gym. The social context could be a barrier as people with a disability may be made to feel unwelcome. The social context is often a barrier for people with prader willi syndrome when exercising in the community. It is surrounded, the social context is surrounded by the expectation of normality. And often gyms will have equipment which are suited for people of average height and weight. As people with prader willi syndrome often experience behavioural problems, this can be seen as a barrier to participation due to the wider community's reaction. Practices which may make people with a disability feel unwelcome within the gym environment can be the depiction of gyms in advertisements or words and deeds of people who attend such settings, making them feel unwelcome adding to the barrier of the social context. Being ignored and staring have been described as barriers by people with acquired disabilities exercising in gyms. However, there are some supports. Supportive and understanding staff are positive influences to people being made to feel welcome in settings such as gyms and the building of relationships with exercise therapists or other support staff in these gyms. Research has shown, as Nora has mentioned, that exercising in a community gym can encourage a sense of belonging and empowerment for the individual with a disability. And benefits for people with acquired disability have been described as improved physical and social well-being, which is important for overall well-being and quality of life. The four research questions that I aim to answer in this thesis are centred around physical activity for people with PWS and the social context. As I've mentioned, the social context is an important factor to consider when discussing community participation in physical activity. The first question we aim to answer is what is currently known about physical activity for people with prader willi syndrome? Secondly, what are the barriers and facilitators to physical activity for children with prader willi syndrome? Thirdly, what happens when people with prader willi syndrome exercise at a community gym? 
And lastly, what were the experiences of people with Prader-Willi syndrome when they exercised at a community gym? The research questions stated previously will aim to be answered through four accompanying studies. I'll briefly explain the studies while, as mentioned, going into more detail about the third. The first study is a literature review and the second a qualitative study involving parents of young children with PWS. The second half of the thesis will incorporate data from the PRESTO trial which is an ethnographic study conducted as part of the PRESTO trial and a second qualitative study. I'll run through studies one, two and four in brief and then spend the remainder of the presentation discussing the protocol for the third study, which is about to commence. Firstly, we'll be conducting a literature review. This literature review will aim to map current literature surrounding three main concepts. Prader-Willi syndrome, community participation, and the impact of an intellectual disability. The social ecological model will be used as a framework as this model allows for the grouping of literature into the categories you can see on the right. The social ecological model has long been used to understand the impact of varying levels of research and can describe the interaction and importance of each category to one another. We'll be using this model to also understand the, where the gaps in the literature currently lie and how they intertwine. The second study will be a qualitative study and will be conducted with parents or caregivers of children aged four to 12 with Prader-Willi syndrome. This study will be conducted using semi-structured interviews to understand the barriers and facilitators to physical activity for young children who are of a primary school age with Prader-Willi syndrome. We'll be focusing on the Australian context for this study and participants will be recruited from the Australasian Prader-Willi syndrome database housed at the Telephone Kids Institute in Western Australia. This study has been developed in response to the need outlined by the Prader-Willi syndrome community. And at its completion, we aim to develop and provide resources for parents, which is important as our translation. Thirdly, we'll be conducting a focused ethnography as part of the PRESTO trial. The primary aim of any ethnography, whether it be traditional or focused, is to describe what is happening in a community or setting. Qualitative methods such as ethnographies have been used on many occasions to understand the experiences of people with a disability within a setting. A focused ethnography is similar in many ways to a traditional ethnography. However, it is conducted over a much smaller time frame and in only one specific setting. This focused ethnography will be conducted with 10 participants rather than a community as a whole, and they'll be linked by the common aspect of participating in the PRESTO trial. The last study to be completed in the thesis is a second qualitative study, again, part of the PRESTO trial. I aim to answer the question, what were the experiences of, the, of people with PWS when they were exercising in a community gym as part of the intervention. This study will involve all participants, the exercise professionals and parents and caregivers if they agree to be a part of the interviews. Semi-structured interviews again will be used for this study. As part of the intervention, we ask that the participants with Prader-Willi syndrome take photo and video data during their exercise um, routines and we will be using that data to supplement the interviews. And as mentioned, I'll be using the remainder of the presentation to discuss the focused ethnography. As there is little evidence which describes the experiences of people with PWS in a community gym setting, this study aims to answer the question, what are the happenings in a community gym within the social context when a person with PWS exercises in this setting? And to do that, we aim to understand the social context for people with PWS in the community gym and also to observe the actions and interactions which occur between people with PWS and others in the gym. To answer this question, we've devised a protocol which will be integrated within the PRESTO trial. The methods for this study must first be explained by describing the epistemology we'll be using. The epistemology of the study describes the theory of knowledge and what lens we'll use to create this knowledge. It's like looking through a telescope, except the other way around. You see bigger picture and then smaller picture and then smaller picture as you go. 
There are many epistemologies that exist, such as positivism and constructivism, each describing their own way in which knowledge is created and understood. The epistemology we'll be using for this study, however, is social constructionism. And social constructionism describes that reality is created by a person through their interaction with others and their environment. So my, for example, my reality is currently being created through my interaction with the presentation. The theoretical perspective is the second layer to describing how this focused ethnography will be conducted and is used to bring a deeper understanding to the epistemology. The study, the, the framework we'll be using for this study is interpretive description. The foundation of this theory is that when data is created, it is used to incite change in the environment where it is collected. Participant observation will be used to collect data in the form of field notes. These field notes will be taken on pen and paper by me in the community gym setting. I'll be using overt observations, which is a type of observation that allows the participant to know that I'm there. And this is to minimize the stress and anxiety of the participant with PWS whilst they're in the gym. I'll be also contacting the participants or their families a week leading up to the sessions. So just to let them remind them that I'll be coming again. In the field notes, actions and interactions of the participant in the community gym will be described with rich descriptions. Field notes will describe my observations of what happens before and following any interactions the participant has whilst they're in their gym intervention. This can be anywhere in the gym from working out at the machines to the water fountains. And these interactions may include verbal or nonverbal with other patrons or their exercise professionals. Immediately after the observation session has been completed, I'll read through the notes and add anything that has been missed from my memory. Field notes aim to tell a story of what happened in the gym through the lens of social constructionism. So that means we're looking at the field note, we're looking at the field notes through what reality does the participant see with their interactions. It is important to note, however, that these field notes create only one reality out of a possible many others. As Nora has previously mentioned, the participants in Victoria will be asked when they consent at the beginning of the trial if they wish to be a part of the ethnographic study. The gym staff will be made aware of my coming into the gym to conduct the ethnography and that there will be no identifying information regarding the gym or other patrons recorded during the process. The 10 participants from Victoria will be chosen from, or rather they would opt in to the ethnographic study and they could be any age of the participants in the trial and that's between 30 to 60 years old. The 10 participants who are to be part of the ethnography can be from either the control or the intervention groups. And the, for each participants, there'll be three observations at three separate time points. The first in month two, the second in month four, and the third in month six. Thematic analysis will be the method used to analyze the data. And thematic analysis, this is, was chosen because of it is flexible across many epistemologies and perspectives. Data, is, data will be created from the field notes and will be transcribed by me and put into the software and Vivo, which will support the analysis. Thematic analysis is often con conducted through line by line coding, meaning that going through each line of the transcript and developing in the first instance codes. Codes can be described as the smaller parts which come together using relationships to form themes. Thematic analysis encourages the importance of seeing patterns within the data. And this is also a key part of the interpretive description framework. This allows for queries to be followed within the data. Data analysis will be conducted sim simultaneously throughout the co data collection phase. This is so that I may constantly be able to compare the data I'm collecting with the data that is being analysed and if necessary make iterations to the observations to better answer the question. Data analysis will be done collaboratively with the research team 
and constant discussions regarding the meaning of codes and their relationships will be aided and developed through these conversations with the team. As the team each brings their own expertise and understandings to the analysis process from a wide range of disciplines, it will create a rigorous analysis process. Rigor is an important part of the qualitative method. It describes how the data stays trustworthy and can use a multi multitude of methods. There are four main facets to rigor, credibility, trustworthiness, dependability, and translatability. Credibility refers to how credible is the data? And this will be ensured by having a diverse range of participants, if possible, within the ethnography. Trustworthiness will be maintained through researcher reflexivity. This means that the researchers will be constantly going back and forth with each other to minimize any discrepancies within the data. And so that's between myself and the, my PhD supervisory team. Dependability refers to how the data will be reported and this study will be reported according to the standards for reporting qualitative research or the SRQR for short. Translatability means how will the findings be translatable to others? Um, hence, we're hoping to recruit a diverse group of people within the study group through a wide range of age groups and genders if possible. But we do acknowledge that the geographical barriers of this study is only completed at one of the study sites and it is only being conducted with 10 people. As has been mentioned, there is currently little literature which describes the experiences of people with PWS in a community gym setting. This study aims to describe the social context and how it can impact a person with disability when exercising in a gym. We aim to bring the understanding of multiple other frameworks together to understand how the social context influences such setting. As has been mentioned by Jenny and Nora, the ICF combines the medical and social model of disability into a perspective which encourages the importance of participation on well-being and overall quality of life. Whilst the model of social context can aid in understanding how these findings can be interpreted in relation to the individual. Bringing together these frameworks can create a deeper understanding of the data and the barriers and facilitators which affect a person with PWS in the social context of a community gym. Through the method of a focused ethnography, we hope that we can gain a greater understanding of the experiences people with PWS have whilst being part of this randomised control trial, giving a greater context to the effectiveness of the intervention. The implications of this study are that we aim to improve the experiences of people with PWS in a community gym setting. And at the completion of this study, we also aim to develop strategies. And these strategies may be used by other stakeholders, such as gyms or parents, to teach them how they, or let them understand how they may better be able to support people with PWS using these facilities. I would like to acknowledge again the Prada Willy Research Foundation Australia and the Foundation for Prada Willy Research USA for the top up to my scholarship and also my supervisors, Professor Nora Shields, Professor Nick Taylor, Professor Christine Bigby and Associate Professor Downs for their support through this process. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well done, Cara. Um, we might move straight on um, and then take questions at, at the end uh, so that we don't run out of time for Georgia. Um, yeah. So I'm going to hand straight over to Georgia, who um, is also one of Nora's PhD students, who I'm much less familiar with, um, but is, uh, I think, more than a year into a PhD and is talking about um, a scoping review that she's done a qualitative study yeah okay so she's talking about the study that she's done or about to do so I've i'll just hand finished. over to you to explain okay sure. <laughs> this is a little sneak peek at um, the qualitative study that i've just finished and submitted to, um, to developmental medicine so um, hopefully we'll hear back from them soon uh, so um, my name's georgia i'm a phd candidate here at la trobe and i'm also a physio by background and I've worked with young adults with developmental disabilities at a transition service here in Melbourne. 
Um, my PhD is looking at factors influencing physical activity for young people with disabilities and how we can facilitate their participation in community settings. Oh, Uh, so first, a little bit of background to this study and how it came about. Um, Nora gave you a little bit of an overview before, um, but we know that young adults with developmental disabilities are typically less active than the general population. And as she mentioned, being physically active is important for physical health and well-being and reducing the risk of developing those secondary health conditions like heart disease, lung disease and diabetes. Um, and this is particularly important for these young adults because they're at greater risk of developing these secondary conditions. So in the most part, um, the research has an exercise promotion has largely focused on these physical benefits to exercise. But more recently, research has been showing that for people, for most people really, social connection and mental well-being are also motivators for physical activity. So with young adults with disabilities more likely to experience um, anxiety and depression as they transition into adulthood, this could be quite an important link for this group. Um, this transition phase into adulthood, which occurs from around the mid-teens uh, into the mid-twenties, is so important for social development, for developing a sense of identity and for long-term health-related behaviours. Unfortunately, this transition to adulthood also comes with reduced access to services and supports. So with the move from paediatric into adult health systems and the move from school into the community. So to date, there's been a little research with this young adult group um, who are transitioning into their adult lives and responsibilities. From previous research and big population surveys like the one that Nora mentioned earlier, um, we, we also know that young adults with disabilities are interested in being physically active and they often list community activities like walking, swimming, sport and the gym as places that they would like to exercise. But supporting young people to be active in the activities that they are interested in and in the community can be quite challenging. So limited local opportunities, inappropriate physical environments and negative social experiences are frequently reported by young people as barriers. Uh, at the moment, we know very little about gym exercise for this group, despite it being consistently reported as a desired place to exercise. And this is starting to change, um, most recently with the FitSkills trial that Nora mentioned, which included 123 young people with any disability, and they found that the gym can be a safe and feasible space for exercising. So my study is linked to that big fit skills trial and it aimed to understand the factors that influence participation in community-based gym exercise for young adults with cerebral palsy who had completed that fit skills gym program. So just a quick overview of the fit skills program. Uh, fit skills was run out of the university here at La Trobe and it was developed by Nora and her team. It's a 12 week, twice a week gym program. And the key feature of the program is that each young person is matched up with a uni student buddy to exercise with. So the buddy is not a health professional or a trainer. As the buddy, they volunteer their time and they exercise alongside the young person each session. Before the program, the team at the uni organises um, individual exercise programs based on the participant goals and abilities, and they were made by trained health professionals, so physios or exercise physiologists. The cost of the program was covered as part of the trial and the participants just needed to be able to get themselves to and from the gym. So whether that be um, on their own or with family or support workers. It was run at um, community gyms close to the young adults homes and the gyms were mostly run by local councils or the YMCA. Um, during the trial, 123 young people aged 13 to 30 completed the program across 22 gym sites in Melbourne. So for my study, uh, I was particularly interested in those late teens and transitioning into adulthood group. There were 41 young adults aged 15 to 30 um, who had cerebral palsy and 39 of those participated in my study uh, with the average age being about 20 years old. 30% um, of these young adults also had an intellectual disability and uh, some of the other concurrent conditions um, included autism, epilepsy and mental health diagnoses. 
Most of the young adults were in some form of education, like school, TAFE or uni, and uh, they mostly completed their own interviews. So we conducted 39 interviews after they completed the FitSkills 12-week um, exercise. And uh, from there, as a team, we analysed all the interviews to see if there were common ideas that they were talking about. And these ideas were grouped into themes um, and we used the family of participation related constructs to interpret the results. So Nora um, popped this up earlier and this is the family of participation related constructs. It looks at the way that different elements of the person, like their sense of self, their preferences and their capabilities, um, interact with the environment that they're in. So in this case, the gym, the context of participation, like having a student buddy, and the participation in the activity itself. So um, how involved they felt and their attendance. From the interviews, um, 12 key factors emerged which had influenced their participation in gym-based physical activity. Um, these are shown in the squared boxes and um, cost was a standalone theme. We then used the fa family of participation related constructs from that previous slide to look at how they interacted with each other and found that the 12 themes really fell into four key areas. So social factors, psychological factors, organisational factors and cost, which I'll now go into in a little bit more detail. So the social opportunity to exercise with a peer really sparked the young people's interest in fit skills and in gym exercise. It was highly valued by the participants and it differentiated fit skills from their other physical activity experiences. Just by virtue of having someone to attend with, they felt more at ease in the gym and had less concerns about standing out or not knowing what to do. So by the end of the program, it was one of the key preferences that the young adults had for ongoing physical activity. Learning together was really the key mechanism in which the Fit Skills program changed the context of that gym environment for the young adults. So the ability to work out together and learn together as peers played an important role in helping them to settle into the program and develop their own skills and knowledge. For many, exercising together as friends, as opposed to with an instructor or with a therapist, really enabled them to explore their abilities and challenge themselves physically. Having the student buddy also helped to establish accountability and provided incentive to attend the sessions, which really helped set them up for early success. So the twice a week for 12 week structure um, also helped to develop consistency with the exercises and was seen as the ideal time to just try something new, build some new habits and develop new skills. The importance of this routine and accountability um, was probably most notable, noticeable when it was absent. So for participants who experienced interruptions to their program, um, and this was usually due to difficulty finding time to schedule with the buddy, or if the buddy was unreliable, they reported less benefits from the program. And in addition to just having someone to exercise with, the development of the relationship between the young adults and the buddy over time really played an important role in their feelings of involvement or engagement in the gym. So making exercise fun, or for some of those who weren't very keen exercises beforehand, um, just making it less boring, most of the young adults described a gradual change from peers to friends and for some even into lasting friendships after the program. The changes in this relationship were really linked to increased motivation, increased effort with the exercises and a sense of belonging. Perhaps most importantly, um, the social element had a mediating effect on many of the other factors. For instance, the buddy relationship helped to overcome barriers related to logistics, time, motivation and attitudes to exercise. And having fun with the buddy really magnified many of the psychological benefits achieved from the program. So psychological factors. Um, before I talk about the psychological benefits, um, I'll just talk a little bit about the sense of self and activity capabilities before the program. So the young adults uh, frequently talked about worries relating to feeling self-conscious and their self-efficacy in the gym before the program. Self-consciousness was usually described relating to people looking at them because of their disability or related to their sense of belonging in the gym itself. So particularly fitting in with, as they describe them, the gym junkie guys and the show-offs. 
This was closely linked to their self-efficacy in the gym setting. Um, there were worries about doing the wrong thing and standing out or doing the wrong thing and injury. So before the program, many of them did not feel that they had the skills or knowledge to exercise in the gym without support. I mentioned earlier that meeting people and having fun in the gym really amplified the positive outcomes of the program. The young adults reported many mental health benefits driven by their relationship with the body and the social nature of the activity. They discussed feeling better about themselves, feeling more alert, energetic and enthusiastic towards physical activity. And others described how physical activity provided opportunities to maintain positive mental health into the future as a way to relax, clear their head and improve their sleep. And this influenced their motivation and attitudes towards ongoing physical activity. Confidence was the other widely reported benefit. For some, it related to developing a sense of belonging in the gym and feeling less concerned that they would stick out like a sore thumb. For others, it related to confidence in their physical capabilities and a sense of achievement from experiencing physical improvement. Importantly, these benefits often extended beyond the gym environment into daily life. They described feeling happier and more motivated to engage in other social and community settings like school, work and family life and greater confidence in their physical performance in these settings. So organisational factors, um, trust was a really important um, factor. Trust in the program, especially uh, initiate that initial commencement of the program. So the parents and the young adults, they had a level of trust in fit skills because it was disability specific and it was run by the university in collaboration with trusted organisations like Cerebral Palsy Support Network and Down Syndrome Victoria. Secondly, um, the logistical burdens. Um, so the logistical effort of organising physical activity programs was usually described as difficult. This primarily related to hiring support workers, applying for funding, organising exercises programs, finding a gym or organising transport. So most believed that they needed specialised disability support and they felt that there were gaps relating to age, um, their disability type and the lack of disability knowledge within community recreation services. Even participants with mild impairments said that they still wanted support because they felt like they always had to do it by themselves. Following fit skills, many of the young adults were interested in continuing gym programs, but they did talk about having to weigh up the logistical effort with the benefits that they experienced. And thirdly, um, despite initial concerns about standing out or doing the wrong thing, um, most of the young adults reported changed perceptions about the gym environment after the program. So the community gyms were seen as safe and appropriate environments for people with disabilities to be active. Um, particularly having staff on hand, being dry and indoors, and having equipment that was adaptable to their needs. So the community gyms were perceived to have a friendly atmosphere and a community vibe, which facilitated a sense of belonging and inclusion. For instance, um, some young adults described seeing other community activities like junior basketball or roller derby going on really made them feel like it was a place for everybody. and cost. So the majority of participants and their families um, considered cost was a big factor for ongoing attendance. Gym memberships were seen as a lot of money to fork out, um, particularly for those supporting themselves financially or reliant on government income support. For all the participants, value for money relative to the frequency of attendance was important. So with that one or two sessions a week identified as the ideal frequency, Paying for full memberships was perceived to be um, unfair or wasted money. Uh, additionally, where they required multiple supports like transport or a support worker, this was seen as paying double while also increasing that organisational um, burden of attending the gym. So in summary, um, and just bringing it back to that interaction between the person and their environment and the activity that they're doing, um, there was a definite sense of there being a sort of two, two people, the pre-fit skills young adults and the post-fit skills young adults. The social context of the fit skills program where they exercised with the student buddy um, played such an important role in so many of the factors. Um, we've encircled that in with the black line just to recognise that the gym itself 
was actually the same environment. But what changed um, was the way that the young adults experienced that environment with their student buddy. We can also see that through their participation in the gym program, there were outcomes that extended beyond the gym and into their other life activities. So finding what works for me was kind of the key message that really summarised the themes raised by the young adults. They identified that their experience um, was important to being able to identify what worked and what didn't. And what really worked for the young adults about fit skills was that the program facilitated the social context while reducing the organisational effort and cost. So our results highlighted the role that physical activity can have in positive psychological health, like confidence, mood and self-efficacy. And that this was a really important motivator for ongoing physical activity for this group. Physical activity for people with disabilities is often, as Nora mentioned, often focused on the physical benefits, um, but our findings suggest that we probably need to rethink the way that we promote and talk about physical activity for this group to better align with the social involvement and the mental health benefits that they considered most important. Um, as I mentioned, exercise with a social focus was highly valued and for fit skills was considered the differentiating factor from other programs. So having this social aspect to the program really helped to reduce the impact of other barriers like transport, self-consciousness and motivation. It was such a universal factor for the participants that it's something that um, we really need to consider when we're working to facilitate physical activity participation for these young adults. And finally, um, the logistical effort and cost um, have been frequently reported as barriers for people with um, both developmental and acquired disabilities. Um, here in Australia, obviously, the NDIS can provide some financial support for some of the associated costs like transport, support workers or therapists. Um, however, membership to gyms is currently not funded. And for many of our participants, um, this meant that ongoing attendance was just not possible. Um, Additionally, when there was support available, it came with that organisational effort. So some more coordination between the funding agencies, support coordinators and gym sites, um, as well as health services would potentially reduce the financial and logistical burdens of gym participation. So where to next? Um, well, this is the first gym-based study specifically with young adults with cerebral palsy. Many of the factors uh, mentioned are, are reflected across other disability groups. Uh, what we really need to look at is um, how do we take these factors and start to develop some strategies to either address the barriers or improve the facilitators um, to better enable these young adults to exercise in the gym because they have told us that that is what they have a desire to do. Um, so the next phase of my PhD will be working with um, the young adults, um, their families, health professionals and gyms to develop and prioritise some strategies to facilitate participation for this group. So you can stay tuned for that. Uh, I just want to thank the FitSkills participants for all their time um, and energy, as well as the FitSkills partner organisations and um, CP Achieve who support my PhD with the scholarship. Thank you very much.